The Transatlantic Network on Political Europe presents What are we talking about when we talk about the politicization and the politicization of Europe for citizens? Very good question. Let me try to give a broad answer and perhaps I hand over to Laurie for a more specific citizen's perspective. Um, it's quite a broad question and the European Union is a very unique entity. It's sui generis, as we like calling it. It's halfway between an international organization and a federal state, and there are simply no other international organizations like it. And because of the unique path it has followed, it has long been insulated from mainstream political contestation. And we can say that it has relied almost exclusively on output legitimacy rather than input legitimacy. Put it differently, we can say that it has been legitimized by the effectiveness of its policy outcomes instead of its responsiveness to EU citizens. And this has been the case because the founding fathers of the EU, such as Jean Monnet, wanted to protect the peace project. After the Second World War, the European public was understandably quite sensitive, specifically to the idea of cooperation with Germany. And we know that Jean Monnet himself actually asked the news agencies to not cover the European integration project as such. And the idea in the early days was therefore to protect the vital peace project from any potential political controversy or contestation. But this situation has changed drastically in the recent past, mainly due to three factors. Firstly, it's growing involvement in policymaking. If we think about it, it used to be a community about coal and steel, but today we're talking about a common currency, a common immigration policy, and much more. Secondly, the increasing significance of European issues and actors at the domestic level. They're becoming more and more visible. And thirdly, the recent weakening of the consensus on the main rationale for integration. There are more and more questions raised on the necessity and direction of the integration project, along with your scepticism, especially when we go through periods where economic prosperity is no longer guaranteed, such as the Eurozone crisis, we start seeing that the EU can easily be politicized. But what do we mean by politicization? I will follow my wonderful colleague's definition, uh, Laurie and uh, Frédéric Merin defined it as the process through which an issue previously considered as non-political becomes the source of conflicts and cleavages in a given social space. And to look at some other definitions, De Wilde describes it more specifically as the result of a process of polarization carried out by a growing number of actors and resulting in high salience in the public sphere. On the other hand, depoliticization although being equally important, is a phenomenon that is much less studied. And we can say that it's the opposite. And we can say that it's something that is considered as quite controversial and political before taking a back seat. Um, but maybe Lori has more specific um, points on how it's perceived by citizens. No, you're right. Uh, well, uh, when we talk about politicization and attitude, so citizen's attitude, we really define it exactly as you, as you put it, as a, an issue that produces um, a cleavage, that produces a polarization in attitudes, and that, is, uh, that, that became salient uh, for citizens. Um, so when we say that, uh, when we look at whether the European uh, issue is politicized, what we look at is if um, in a country, the fact that this country is part of the EU uh, is something that is salient uh, for, for its citizens, whether the, um, the outcomes of integration is something that is uh, de debated, whether um, the end point of integration is something that is put into question and open to conflict or not. So that means um, if there is a politicization of the EU at the citizen level, it means that we will find a diversity of opinions, some people being strongly in favor of integration, others being strongly against. Um, we would find um, different visions of the European project with the citizens uh, being more in favor or against, uh, as Osla mentioned, the economic integration with a common currency, a single market, 
some citizens being in favor, for instance, of a, a different kind of integration, a social integration or political project. So we accept, we, um, we expect to see a um, variety of vision of what is the end game of integration. On the contrary, when we look at depoliticization at the citizen level, um, we define it as um, citizens, citizens not having a um, structured position on uh, integration. So the European issue not being part of a larger set of political uh, opinion. We uh, expect integration to um, be something that is not salient for citizens. So that doesn't matter when they make decisions such as um, for which party they're voting, on uh, whether they're voting in favor or against a referendum, for instance. So this implies either that the issue for citizens is extremely consensual, meaning that everyone agrees, for instance, or that they feel completely detached from it, estranged, and that this is not salient uh, for them. What evolution can we see in attitudes? And I can say that to reiterate my earlier point, perhaps, until recently, the EU was considered to be a depoliticized entity at many levels. First, if you look at the academic world, academically speaking, just like political figures such as Jean Monnet, the first generation of scholars such as Ernst Haas and their neo-functionalist way of thinking emphasized the technocratic angle of the integration as opposed to the political one. So the academia very much followed that line of thinking. Second, if you look at political parties, once again, to protect the peace project, in most of the member states, the main political parties avoided opposing one another on European integration related issues. And this included all the mainstream political parties in the middle, such as social democrats, Christian democrats, liberals, depending on the country. And the result was that for a very long time, citizens did not encounter diverging views on European integration. And thirdly, from the citizens perspective, the integration project and its really complex, multi-layered institutional architecture appeared simply too complicated and remote, distant to play any part in their daily political thinking and conversations. And as a result of the hesitance present at all these three levels, the EU and European issues were almost isolated from political conflict. But since the beginning of 2000s, European studies have started reconsidering the process of politicization. And it started perhaps more from a theoretical and a normative perspective, mainly questioning the democratic deficit and the democratic need for political contestation. And in the later stages, these attempts also moved on to empirical analyses. And today we can see that the increase of political conflict over integration and the salience of the European issue in elections, the role of political elite in these processes are quite well documented. To give some well-known examples, there are empirical studies of politicization on issues such as the famous Volkerstein Directive, or on the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, the EU-US um, trade deal, and on referendums such as studies looking into the constitutional treaty referendums, the Brexit referendum. And these empirical studies look, in, look into the ways in which political actors, these can be political parties, social movements, but the ways in which they politicize the issue. And there are also empirical studies of depoliticization, I'm tempted to say, but these are somewhat less direct and do not really use that label as openly as the studies of politicization. An example would be studying the instances where the national governments use the EU as a scapegoat to de-escalate an issue in the national politics, for instance, or where citizens feel quite alienated and estranged from the EU. But again, the citizen's perspective is much more Laurie's expertise. Well, it's true that you, we see this, uh, this dichotomy as well when we look at citizens' attitude. First, um, as, you, um, as you put it, we see definitely more politicization. Um, as time passes over the last two decades, citizens have been increasingly vocal in expressing their discontent with the EU. 
Uh, I could use uh, the exact same example uh, that like the Bolkenstein Directive or the TTIP, these were uh, issues where uh, political parties or trade unions uh, had mobilized, but so have uh, citizens as well. Um, and uh, notably when they were given a chance to express their discontent through referendum, uh, we, we saw, for instance, in 2005 for the referendum on the um, European Constitutional Treaty in France that... Um, clear alternative visions of the, Europe, the European project have emerged from the political party side, but as well um, from the citizen side. And um, one explanation for that is, is also that as economic integration has been achieved, citizens in their everyday life have started to get a better sense of consequences and opportunities that came with the integration, as well as the limits that a common um, scheme meant for uh, not only the national economic policy. And this perception have, of course, increased during the Great Recession and the Euro crisis in 2010 and the years after. And we saw that some political parties, in particular the Green and the, the Radical Left, have vividly pushed for an alternative European project. Um, and they have been followed to some extent by uh, citizens' votes. Already, when we started looking in the early 90s, we see that um, we, we saw a decrease in support for, for integration that has been qualified uh, as the end of the permissive consensus, meaning that support for integration fell from over 70% to 50% um, on average. Um, so this expression, the permissive consensus, consensus, is used to describe the period from um, the early days of integration, referring um, to the Jean Monnet period, um, as we, we talked in the, in the beginning of this video, from, uh, so from the 50s to the 90s, where public opinions were overly in favor of integration, but from afar and without uh, structured opinions. So <clears throat> after starting with the, with the 90s, we saw um, a deepening of support in some groups, but also an increase in opposition, especially during referendum campaigns. And this is what is called the constraining dissensus, meaning that it's not that everyone is nowadays against integration, but that people actually are supposed to have a better idea of what's going on and that um, attitudes are more polarized than they used to be and that the issue is more salient. So this heterogeneity in citizens' views of integration is now an important part of the political game or political elites. And indeed, we saw in 2014 and 2019 uh, for the European elections that Eurosceptic and Eurocritical parties from the left and the right have gained prominence, reaching almost a quarter of the votes in both elections. So as we see, the politicization of the issue is visible across the, the, the board. Um, and we've seen as well and documented a um, stronger impact of uh, attitudes toward integration in voting behavior over the past uh, six years. However, when we um, keep looking and we turn to qualitative studies, uh, we see a slightly different picture. Now, for the past two decades, several researchers have established that despite the fact that knowledge uh, about the EU is slowly increasing, it still remains a very distant system for citizens, either at, as an issue or as specific institutions. Citizens show a great deal of indifference and ambivalence over European integration. And when we look at attitudes, we also see that if we follow the same timeline um, as before, we see that the share of citizens who um, are ambivalent about integration, uh, who think that it is neither a good or a bad thing, has grown and now represents 30% uh, of attitudes. And this share goes even higher, uh, up to 40% in countries like Italy or Hungary or Slovakia. So ambivalence and indifference are there, and they also vary from one social group to another. So what we see from these qualitative studies is that politicization rarely happens among citizens uh, at a deep level, but, and when it does, it is not often linked to a specific dimension of the project. And conversely, the lack of knowledge about the EU, the fact that it is a complex system uh, and uh, <clears throat> that, that also leads to a specific form of 
an informed politicization that might be um, more based on a generic feeling of disenfranchisement rather than on actual uh, knowledge and structured um, attitudes. And this feeling is particularly strong for young citizens. How can we study it? Okay, so when we want to study politicization among citizens, well, first we can look at um, signs. So how do we characterize politicized attitudes versus depoliticized one? For instance, if we study um, voting behavior, uh, we, can, um, we can investigate whether attitudes toward Europe are actually uh, something that citizens take into account when they're voting for European or national election, whether their choice in terms of party uh, is somehow determined by uh, what they think about the European project, how they allocate responsibility between the different level in this multi-level system. This is one way to see. Um, we can also investigate how citizens perceive and define the European project. Again, as we mentioned in the beginning, Something that is depoliticized is something that is not put into question for which there is no alternative and uh, for which citizens do not feel any uh, agency. They're not feeling that they, they could be in control of uh, the end point of the direction. So what we can do is that we can look at what is the direction um, of the project for citizen. Is it perceived as apolitical? Is it perceived as going more to the right, more to the left? What is the, um, the principles guiding integration? What is the project? What type of Europe do people want? And how do they perceive uh, power distribution between the different level, between countries within the EU, how political choices are made? So here we're talking about how citizens perceive this mechanism and this dynamic. And one important marker of politicization or depoliticization, for instance, is when citizens express that there is a plausible alternative to a specific political choice. When they say that there is no choice, that things cannot change, we are in a clear, deeply decided situation. And if I can give an example, um, this, what, this is what we did for one of the RESTEP studies. Uh, we conducted 21 focus groups in four European cities with groups of citizens from various social and political backgrounds to see how they talked about Europe whether the issue was conflictual, and if so, across which lines. And so far, what we found is that in some segments, there is a strong feeling of depossession and the feeling that there is no alternative. So this feeling can vary in terms of strength, depending on political background or political knowledge. But uh, on, on the other hand, we also, had, we also saw citizens that were expressing that the European project could be different. Uh, we, we also saw that citizens have distinct vision of Europe and that this different vision can actually translate into political choice and voting behavior in the latest election. Maybe, um, of course, one of the dimensions that matters when we look at attitudes is what triggers politicization on and off in the sense that attitudes for citizens do not come as a given are impacted by other other factors and other actors. Yes, and I, this is an area that we find particularly interesting, and this definitely needs more research in the literature, and we're very early in our stages of looking into it, but we can definitely talk about two main triggers that we can already identify in the existing studies. The first is the role of political actors, which is quite important. And political actors can really mean a full range of actors here, political parties, individual actors such as prime ministers, members of parliament, members of European parliament, social movements or the media. And I personally study the types of framing and communication strategies actors use in EU referendum campaigns. And in my work looking at 14 referendums in seven different countries, I find that in all cases, the, the negative immediate and emotional arguments that connect with the public can unexpectedly win over arguments focusing on abstract and distant benefits, which are not as memorable as the other ones. For example, in a recent book with um, Nadeau and Belanger called Framing Risky Choices, we argue that the key to the Brexit puzzle lies in political discourse as well. Everyone expected the public to avoid an uncertain future 
um, outside the EU. But in fact, the campaign really framed it, remained the frame choice as risky as the leave one. And, you know, there are lots of interesting slogans like take back control, where it, it was very emotional and very potent. Having said that, framing strategies can also be a vehicle for depoliticization. Actors could frame the issue in a way to shift the blame to other arenas or depoliticize it. If you look at some other factors, the second trigger that comes to mind is specific events. And the EU has really clearly witnessed this in the last one or two decades. It has faced multiple crises in its recent past, the Eurozone crisis, the migrant crisis, Brexit crisis, and now the COVID-19 crisis. And these certainly provide sudden spikes in politicization. However, their impact these crises, the, the, the impact of these crises on politicization is very much mediated by the framing strategies of political actors that I was just mentioning and more broad, broadly blame politics. So any study trying to understand the impact of triggers needs to look at these different factors and how they interact. And hopefully in the near future, Laurie and I will find opportunities to study these triggers in greater detail, specifically to understand when and how they switch politicization on and off and to explore politicization and depoliticization together as the two faces of the same phenomenon. <laughs>